Hey gang, guess who learned to do the blurry effect on Camtasia? BAM! Or maybe you want pixelated. That was dedicated to whoever gave my book a bad review on Amazon and started with, everybody in my class hates this book. No, you hated the book. And I'm sorry, but it's gonna happen. You know, you make something and you put it out to the world. Not everybody's gonna like it. Not everybody liked the Deadpool movie. They're wrong, but hey, you can't please everybody. And I think I please most of the people in my class and other classes. I've had people just stop by my office and say, oh yeah, I noticed your name on the door is the same as the name on the book. I just wanted to tell you I liked your book. And if the book really sucked, the department head would get enough complaints that I couldn't use it anymore. Um, but So not everybody in the class hated the book. You hated the book. And odds are the people around you didn't hate the book. Most or none of them did. Um, I'm guessing you just griped and complained and whined about stuff so much that they were willing to say whatever they needed to say to shut you up so they could go on with class or God forbid you were doing it in lab for three hours. And the people on the other side of class or lab, they were just happy they weren't on that side because they can hear your crabby butt all the way over there. So screw you. I'm pretty sure there's somebody from Camtasia, if they ever watch this, they're going to say, this is not what we wanted this to be used for. But. Whew, okay, that feels better. Um, no, I don't go to Amazon to read reviews. Trust me, I don't. I don't really pay that much attention to classroom evaluations anymore. Um, and that's a, another rant I'll say for another time. But... Yeah, I, I used to go to Amazon because I liked, you know, seeing the ranking at the beginning of the semester, and it was nice a couple times a year to see my book break the top million. But I can't even have that anymore, thanks to Mr. and Miss Crabapple. Um, I had another one before that that was actually kind of funny. They didn't like the way that I did my little three-star naming system uh, at the end of my end of the chapter problems. And I can't remember exactly what he said, but he said something to the effect of, you know, this is a science textbook, uh, not a teeny bopper journal. Yeah, that works. Yeah, because when you, th you know, teen people, uh, Tiger Beat, uh, general chemistry textbook, yeah, they, they're all alike, right? So that one I thought was funny. Uh, Mr. and Miss Crabapples, I just, but anyway. Speaking of my book, um, we're going to do a couple examples out of it uh, for the ICE method for solving equilibrium concentrations, which is something I always call equilibrium the stoichiometry of general two, because you know in stoichiometry in general one, once you start stoichiometry, it you're never done with it, and really as long as you take chemistry, you're never done with it. You're gonna do organic labs. You're gonna have to do theoretical yields and percent yields and all that fun stuff. Uh, but in general two, once you start equilibrium, it just seems to never go away. It always pops up until pretty much right up to the end of the semester. For me, the next to last chapter because I cover nuclear chemistry in the very end of general two, and there's really not any equilibrium there. But if you go on to organic, equilibrium's probably going to pop up now and then. Um, it's like that serial killer in a movie that you thought was dead, but nope, start of the fourth act, he's back. Um, but anyway, so we're going to do uh, problem P8 and P9. Uh, we'll start with problem P8 because numerical order seems to make sense. But with problem P8, we're given this reaction to and I just use a generic uh, ABC equation but 2a reacting to EVB and C and um, we're trying to figure out the equilibrium concentrations when you start off with a quarter molar of a and I just noticed when I cut and paste it over to this I didn't give myself a lot of space there did I no. anyway doesn't matter 
But to figure this out, we're going to build start by building an ice table. So remember, ice starts uh, stands for the three sort of stages we're going to look at. I is the initial concentration. So in that, you just look at the problem. We start with 0.25 molar A. They don't say anything about having B or C present, so we assume there's none there. Uh, row C is the change in concentration. So you're looking at two things. You're looking at which way the equilibrium is gonna shift based on what you start with. And when you have zero on one side, it's gonna have to shift to that side because at equilibrium, everybody's present to some degree. So it's gonna shift to the right. We're gonna lose some amount of reactant, gain some amount of product. And to figure out the extent of the shift, um, easiest way to do it is just look at the coefficients because for every one C we're gonna make, uh, we're gonna get one B and we're gonna lose twice as many of reactant A. So again, the plus or minus you just get from the shift, the one X, two X, whatever X, here or there, here or X, there or X, um, everywhere in X, X. You just pull it straight from the coefficient. If it's a one, it's one X, if it's a two, it's two X, etc. So row E is the concentrations at equilibrium. So we're gonna have X amount of each product and for our reactant, we're going to have 0.25, our initial minus however much we lost during the shift. And you'll notice that E is really just adding up the previous two rows, zero plus X is X, this minus that gives you, uh. so that's the first half of solving these kind of problems. Uh, the next half is we're gonna look at our equilibrium constant. So our equilibrium constant is product over reactant. So it's B over C, or B times C, over A squared, squared because it's a two. Remember, you raise everybody to the coefficient. And we just start plugging in everything we know up to this point. We know the equilibrium constant is 114. We know B and C are both X. And A, as much as we know about it, is 0.25 minus 2X. And whatever that is, we're gonna square it. Right. Or another way to rewrite it a little bit is to make the top X squared. Whoops. Oh, yeah, I can't write the pen today. I don't know what's going on. So, to figure out our equilibrium concentrations, we need to solve for X. So there's a, two common ways that you solve for X in general too. Uh, one of them is if you have a square on top or a square on the bottom. Um, you might see a cube now and then, but um, usually you have a square on top, a square on the bottom. Uh, if you take the square root of both sides, actually I'll just do it this way. That'll get rid of the squares. Oh, I'm holding my pen a little weird, that might be why. There we go. Nope. And the square root of 114 is going to be 10.7. And as you continue to solve for X, you'll eventually get something around 0.12. So now that you know what X is, we go back to row E and plug our X in. So 0.25 minus 2X, I keep making the little, now I'm doing it really bad. There we go. That'll give you 0.1. And both B and C are equal to whatever X was. 
which is, actually, did I get that flipped? Oh, yeah, I did. This is 0.12. Yeah. A is 0 0.01. There we go. And there's an easy way to check your work. All right, let's say I screwed up and didn't catch that. And, um, if these are the equilibrium concentrations and our equilibrium constant is 114, we plug these concentrations back into our equilibrium expression. Uh, it should give us something close to the equilibrium constant that was given. So we got x times x, 0 0.12, 0 0.12, divided by 0 0.01 squared. That comes out to 144 which is reasonably close to our given k. We're off by about what, 30. Uh, but, you know, when you have a k that small and you got to do some rounding to solve for x here and there, you know, with rounding errors, that's reasonably close. Um, when you're off, you know it, and you're way off. But, you know, when, you know, 1.2, look at scientific notation, 1.4 times 10 to the 2, that's 1.1 times 10 to the 2. They're really not off by that much. Um, they're, re you know, they're reasonably close to each other. So that's a really common sort of solve for x scenario you run into, right? where you can simplify things a lot by taking the square root of both sides. Um, let's look at another one. Well, this time we'll look at P9, like I just said a minute ago. <coughs> um, and P9 has two parts to it. Um, again, we got an equation. This time we're given equilibrium pressures and a Kp. But remember, whether you're dealing with concentrations or pressures, everything's the same as far as how, what K equals to and the ICE method. You just, again, you're dealing with concentrations or pressures, but neither one really affects what you're doing as far as the math. So again, we'll start with our ice table. C E. So we're given initial pressures of 0.65 for both reactants. Again, they didn't say anything about C being there to start with, so we'll assume it's not. Row C, we got nothing on the product side, so we're gonna lose some reactant, gain some product, and to figure out whether it's x, 2x, 3x, whatever, just take it from the coefficients. Everybody's got a coefficient of one, so you're gonna lose x amount of reactant, gain x amount of product. So at equilibrium, both reactants are gonna be 0.65 minus x, and C, a product is just gonna be x. So again, the next stage or is to uh, look at our expression of K. Oops, actually, I knew I was going to do that. Partial pressures of C over A and B. And plug in everything we know up to this point. We know what K is. Top is x. At the bottom, a and b are the same thing, so it'll be 0.65 minus x minus the same thing. So we'll just go do the square this time to start with. <coughs> so at this stage, the square root trick doesn't work because there's no x squared at the top this time. So the other common thing you might run into is uh, you might have to solve a quadratic but remember there are times when you don't or we can you can sort of get a, around having to solve for a quadratic because we can do this thing called solving by approximation if you look at um, our equilibrium constant and compare that to our initial concentration 
right. to start with our equilibrium constant is really really small which means it's really really reactant favored so it's going to shift to the right to some degree but if our ratio of reactant or product to reactant is that small the shift probably isn't that big uh, also notice that your initial concentration and the value of K they differ by a factor of uh, close to a billion All right. so when the difference between those two things are that wide approximation is probably going to work so the way we approximate is we assume that 0.65 minus X is going to be approximately 0.65 so we replace the bottom part with just 0.65 and now it becomes a heck of a lot easier to solve because now the bottom part is just 0.65 squared so X is going to be 1 times 10 to the negative 8 but remember approximation only works if um, I keep looking at how bad my handwriting is today sorry about that but approximation only works if it obeys what we call the 5% rule which means the part that we remove in this case the minus X bit that part has to be smaller than our initial constant or less than 5% of our initial concentration so in this case you take 5% of 0.65 just multiply it by 0.05 yeah, I get 0.033. So yeah, X is a lot smaller than 5% of 0.65. And it's so small, you could probably, you wouldn't even have to do the math probably. Because 10 to the negative 8 is probably a lot smaller than 5% of that number. And this isn't a um, any kind of chemistry thing. It's more of a statistical thing, the 5% rule. Because any instrument you use has some degree of error. And basically what the 5% rule says is that people in general have agreed that as long as you're 95% accurate, your measurements are considered valid. So you can be 5% errors of 5% or less and that'll be okay. So we're okay here. And X, that's our concentration of C. So we already have that. It's 10 to the negative 8. And 0.65 minus X in this case, you're going to get 0.64999. But when you round back up to the correct number of sig figs, it rounds back up to 0.65. <laughs> so again, very little shifted to the right. And our approximation is pretty much is valid um, especially when you factor in significant figures and if you want to check your work yeah just plug in if you plug in these into your expression of K whoops yeah, you get 2.4 times to the negative 8 dead on so everything checks out. Now let's look at 9B, where it's the exact same equation, but now our KP is 113. So everything we did prior, your ice table, that would be the same. We're dealing with the same equation, so your KP is still the pressure of C over the partial pressure of A and B. And since it's the same ice table, the right side is identical to what we had before. It's just our KP is now a different number. So again, the square root trick doesn't work. Um, is approximation going to work? Uh, we can see. Now, if 0.65 minus X is approximately 0.65, you get 113 
equal to x over 0.65 squared. x in this case would be equal to 47.7, which should raise some red flags in a couple of places. Um, one, um, your concentration over is ridiculously big. Um, a lot, it's a lot bigger than your initial concentration. So if you go back and try to calculate A and B, A and B is going to be 0.65 minus X, which would give you ne something like negative 46. That's not going to be right. You can't have a negative concentration. Um, all right, let's say you didn't catch that. Well, remember the 5% rule. 5% of 0.65 is 0.03. We are way bigger than 5% of point oh of our initial concentration. And again, we're way bigger than our initial concentration. Um, but let's say you didn't catch that. Um, if you do the check and you plug in 47.7 over negative 46 squared, you get a KP of around 126, which actually, no, actually, no, I'm sorry, I see, that's, that's the one coming up when it's right. Uh, okay, I was about to say, that looks okay, but no, it's not, dummy. Uh, I'm looking at the wrong number. Yeah, I get 0.02. So, yeah, that's the wrong one. Um, so yeah, that's your way off. All right, 126 would have been okay. In fact, that's going to be our check in a second. Um, but yeah, if you're if this if you're on the order of 10 to the two, and your your check is on the order of 10 to the negative two, uh, that's um, way more than rounding. You did something really wrong. So at some point, a red flag should have gone up to say. Yeah, approximation is not going to work here. Um, so did you waste your time doing approximation? Uh, no, um, not always. Uh, sometimes you can sort of take an educated guess on whether it's going to work. Because, uh, you know, like I said previously, the bigger the difference between your initial concentration and your, your equilibrium constant, um, the more likely it's going to work. In our last example, uh, P, uh, 9A, uh, they were off. They were different by almost a factor of a billion. So in those cases, it usually works without a problem. In fact, yeah, our X was way smaller than 5% of our initial concentration. But when they're um, really, really close to each other, like 113 to 0.65, they're only different by a factor of, what, 1,000, you know, 100, something like that. When they're that close to each other, approximation is probably going to fail. But let's say you're not sure and you really don't want to do a quad, figure out a quadratic. Um, well, usually, um, it's, as far as you know, risk reward, go ahead and try it because if it works, you saved a lot of time. If it didn't work, well, you didn't lose that much time. If you look at how, what the work we did here. Um, you know, yeah. Solving for, once we approximated the solving for x bit was nothing. We just had to multiply by 0.65 squared. So yeah, if it works, you saved a lot of time. If it didn't work, you really didn't lose a lot of time trying. So yeah, you know, when in doubt, give it a try. But remember the five percent rule, or other sort of red flags we talked about. So um, yeah, you're gonna have to eventually. So you're gonna have to, you know, solve for a quadratic and rewrite it, do your FOIL method thing, and some other stuff that you were probably taught. Um, things I'm gonna go and just skip for the sake of time, but I will go and give you the quadratic. Um, when you when you solve for the quadratic, you get uh, where to go? 113 x squared minus 147.9 plus 47.8 equals zero. 
So that's the quadratic you get when you go from there to there. Um, so yeah, there's your A, your B is negative 147, your C is that. So when you plug that into that quadratic equation, uh, or you go to a website and do it or do it on your calculator. If you do it on your calculator, just make sure your teacher's gonna let you do it in class. Um, if you're one of mine, I'm not. Um, I'm just old fashioned that way. But when you figure out your quadratic, remember a quadratic, you got two possibilities. You got, um, in this case, x is gonna equal 0.727, or it could be 0.582. And usually what happens is one of those two uh, values gives you a negative concentration, kind of like we had earlier when we tried to approximate. So in this case, you know, 0 0.65 minus 0 0.72, that'll give you a negative concentration for your two reactants. So that can't work as a value of X. Uh, the other guy though should work out and it does and let's see, I'm running out of room. Well, I can do the next page. So A will be 0.65 minus X, which gives you 0.068. B is the same thing. C is just X, and that'll be 0.582. And if you want to check your work, you just plug in your these values into your expression of K, so it'd be 0.582 over 0.068 squared, and yet this is where it's equal to 126. So our original K was 113. Yeah, they're not that different, they're reasonably close, especially when you go through all the hassle of figuring out a quadratic, you're gonna get a little error here or there. Um, so yeah, that checks out okay. So, like I said, those are the main sort of scenarios you're going to encounter when you're trying to solve for X. The ice table setup is always going to be the same. Um, it's just, you know, how you solve for X is going to be different. But usually you end up with a case where you can take the square root of both sides. And that simplifies things where you can solve for X relatively easily. Or you have a quadratic that you may or may not be able to... Um, avoid by approximation. But like I said, if you're not sure whether the approximation trick is going to work, go ahead and give it a try because if it works, you save a lot of time. If it doesn't work, you didn't lose that much time trying. So, like the risk reward sort of thing uh, is heavily in favor of giving it a shot. All right, so that'll be it for this time. I will see you guys later. Are they gone? I can't tell. <laughs>